Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya But it's right in front of Prabhupada, that's the problem. Just come closer. Or go that way. Yeah, go to the left. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this is uh, chapter 4, verse 26. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Strota dindindriyan yan ye. Samyamagnishu juvati. Sabda dim vishayananya. Indriyagni gnishu juvati. Throated in Indriyan Yanye 
Samyayagnishu Juvati Sabdadin Vishayan Anya Indrayagnishu Juvati Chant Okay, so translation. This section is uh, being described by Krishna as the different types of sacrifices by different types of personalities. So here in verse 26, it says, Some, the unadulterated brahmachari sacrifice the hearing process and the senses in the fire of mental control, and the others, the regulated householders, sacrifice the objects of the senses in the fire of the senses. Read that again. Some, the unadulterated brahmacharis, sacrifice the hearing process and the senses in, and the senses in the fire of mental control. And others, the regulated householders, sacrifices the objects of the senses in the fire of the senses. Srila Prabhupada's purport, the members of the four divisions of human life, namely the brahmachari, grihas, the vanapras, and sannyas, are all meant to become perfect yogis or transcendentalists. Since human life is not meant for our enjoying sense gratification like the animals, the four orders of human life are so arranged that one may become perfect in spiritual life. The brahmacharis or students under the care of a bona fide spiritual master control the mind by abstaining from sense gratification. The brahmachari hears only words concerning Krishna consciousness. Hearing is the basic principle for understanding and therefore the pure brahmachari engages fully in harer nama nukirtanam, chanting and hearing the glories of the Lord. He restrains himself from the vibrations of material sounds and his hearing is engaged in the transcendental sound vibration of Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. Similarly, the householders who have some license for sense gratification perform such acts with great restraint. Sex life, intoxication, and meat eating are general tendencies of human society. But a regulated householder does not indulge in unrestricted sense life and other sense gratifications. Marriage on the principle of religious life is therefore current in all the civilized human societies because that is the way for restricted sex life. This restricted, unattached sex life is also a kind of yagya because the restricted householders sacrifice his general tendency towards sense gratification 
for a higher transcendental life. Om Gyan Timirandasya Gana Jana Salakaya Chaksu Unmilitam Yena Tasmai Shri Guru Vena Maha Shri Chaitanya Manobistam Stapitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kadam Mayam Dadati Swam Padantikam Nama Om Vishnu Badaya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale Shri Makti Bhakti Vedanta Swami Tinamane Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauravani Pachadine Nirishesha Shunyavadi Pasyatya De Satarine Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadadhar Srivasari Gaur Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare hmm. So sacrifice yagya the word sacrifice comes from the word sacrificio, which is a Latin term which means to make sacred. <laughs> so making sacred means connecting it to the process of offering it as a activity for one's purification in spiritual life. <laughs> Yagya, sacrifice. Uh, leads to bhakti without sacrifice bhakti does not manifest so what is that sacrifice there's two types of sacrifice there's giving up and there's accepting so giving up is mentioned in this particular verse giving up certain things and accepting certain things is also mentioned it mentions that especially for the brahmacharis they should give up hearing about other topics other than things related to Krishna and devotional service. Topics in the mundane world may seem very, what we say, stimulating to the mind, but it doesn't do anything for the soul. And it somehow causes the mind to become disturbed and it becomes very difficult to practice carefully the process of meditation so therefore one should be very diligent in restraining him themselves from hearing topics of the mundane affairs um, and therefore the hearing process must go on so we must hear about something so the process is recommended in the Shravanam Kirtanam about Vishnu to hear and to also chant about the, the Supreme Lord. So it's highly recommended here, as it mentioned specifically for the order of life of Brahmacharya, is that one is, this is the basic principle of understanding. In fact, that applies to all aspects of spiritual orders that one has to learn how to hear. And one has to develop a tendency for hearing about spiritual matters about the nature of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. As Prabhupada mentions in one statement, this is the highest form of piety, to hear and chant the glories of the Lord, because it connects one directly with the Supreme Lord. And therefore it is recommended, developing a taste for hearing and chanting of the Lord will not develop unless, until one starts to give up their desire to hear about the mundane topics of the material world. Uh, we find ourselves in a situation now where there's a lot of news about this uh, particular pestilence that is circulating the globe and causing the news to be the number one topic everywhere in the world now. And so we find even spiritualists are becoming interested in hearing what's going on in this place or that place. Perhaps a little bit of this is required in order to get some understanding of how to live during this, what we say, difficult time, but to indulge in various types of uh, aspects of this and listening over and over again to different Monday will just divert the, the mind's attention away from the real hearing and chanting. 
and cause one to lose the taste to hear and chant about the glories of the Lord, which is the essence of the spiritual practice. <clears throat> so here, Harer Namuk Hirher Nam Namanukirtanam chanting and hearing the glories of the Lord. And this uh, purifies the heart, brings happiness to the mind, and inspires one in devotional practice. So this is recommended. And that's for all orders of life, although here is specifically geared to the brahmachari, still everyone, whatever order of life they're in, should hear and chant the glories of the Lord and refrain from hearing about uh, mundane topics or the general, what we say, gramyakata. Mm -hmm. When Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was instructing Raghunath Das Goswami, he uh, told them, you know, refrain from hearing the talks of the worldly minded people, gramyakata, saribe, because these topics are just. Uh, you know, take one away from mm, spiritual life. Especially people like to speak about other people in the material world. This is a common fear. And it's called gossip. <laughs> when two people get together in the material sense, they always about talking about this or that, about another person's life or about another person's activities, something. <laughs> you know, and when something is really juicy and juicy in the sense that it's really interesting from the material perspective the ears perk up everybody's all ready to you know to absorb themselves in hearing what is about to be said so this is the affairs of the non-devotees and they find great satisfaction in talking about other people and finding fault with others also so devotees have no interest in this, and they consider this worse than poison. This kinchanasya bhagavan, what is that verse? By it's chanted by the Lord Chaitanya, you know. This kinchanasya bhagavan, yes. Bhukasya, parampar jigamasur, something like that. Asadu. And Lord Chaitanya says to hear and to associate with materialistic person is worse than drinking poison willingly. Why? Because this poison is will kill one's spiritual life. <laughs> it's worse than that. Because somehow if one drinks poison, they die. But if they listen to spiritual topics, then their spiritual death is guaranteed. <laughs> And that is worse than material death because if you die materially and you are in good consciousness and you're successful, if you die spiritually, then your fate is, is lost. So Lord Chaitanya was very keen on making these uh, warnings for those who are seriously practicing spiritual life. It says here, similarly, the householders have some license for sex gratification. And Prabhupada says, sex life intoxicated meeting are general tendencies of human society. Of course, those who practice devotional service uh, do not engage in intoxication and meat eating. But living in family life, <laughs> there is what is called uh, Bharata's, what is that? Tathosmi Bharatasabha. Something Krishna says, I am that sex life which is not contrary to the religious principles. So, what he means is sex life that is meant for procreation of children. So, that is the restriction. Um, Prabhupada said, just because you have a wife or a husband doesn't mean you have a license for sex life. Um, this can also, this will also keep one. Uh, in a, what we say, an illusion about about uh, spiritual life because one cannot become determined in Krishna consciousness if one engages in unwanted sex life or illicit sex life. 
So one has to be very careful. Uh, sometimes we find uh, grihastas have a very difficult trouble following that principle because there is such close association, always. And the tendency is that we come out of that culture where sex life is somewhat considered to be the pleasure to be chasing after. And so in all, uh, all phases of life, just like I was reading statistics, that in the play, especially in the United Kingdom, the UK, you know, we have uh, young people engaging in sex life from the time they're 10 and 11 years old. And so it was, not, it was so rampant that it became a, a major statistic that even at 11 years old, you know, people, young kids are engaging in this kind of activity. So, yeah, and this is the, what they saw, this is the adiras of the material world. Everyone is looking for happiness, and the pleasure of the material world seems to culminate in sex desire. And that sex desire manifests in so many different ways. But the ultimate principle is to have union with the opposite sex and try to find some happiness in that. Of course, when you analyze the results of illicit sex life, you find that there are more problems that come from that than any other form of activity. We have the abortion problem. We have the disease problem. We have the broken home problem. We have the single mother problem. We have the, you know, uh, what other problems are there? So many other problems. We have the financial problem to continue to support that type of endeavor. And so many problems come from sex life. So if one can carefully follow, and one should carefully follow the restrictions that are given according to the ashram, for brahmacharis, there's no question of any sex life. And also for sannyasis, for vanaprasas, they retire from that activity. And for grihastas, there's a license for children like that. So it might sound very, very, what we say, rigid. But if we want higher consciousness, as Prabhupada says here, and restricting the... Uh, a restricted, this restricted, unattached sex life is a kind of sacrifice that brings one towards higher transcendental life. Mm -hmm. So this is what it takes to remain, what we say, fixed on the path of devotional service. Unless we get a higher taste in spiritual life, it becomes hard to stay fixed in the process. So giving up sense gratification, particularly sex life is the uh, the pillar that pushes one beyond the normal uh, activities of devotional service and gives one a real sweet taste that's why it says even for people who are not engaged in devotional service if they remain celibate their whole life or if they remain celibate uh, at one point of their life and finish their life through that celibacy, they can attain Brahma Loka <laughs> just by becoming celibate. I remember in the year 2008, we had organized Brahmachari conferences all around. We started in America and we came to the UK after that and there was Brahmachari conferences. So when I, when I started to advertise, I was advertising, uh, these are conferences for celibacy, those who practice celibacy. So, so many ladies were coming forward and wanted to attend the conferences too. And I was saying, well, well, this is just for brahmacharis. They said, well, we are celibate also. I said, that's very nice, but you have to hold your own conference because <laughs> it's not that we mix with brahmacharis and have a conference on celibacy. <laughs> so I thought that was quite interesting. Then I had to change my presentation and saying it's a, not a conference for just for celibates. It's a conference only for the brahmacharis like that. 
And we had some really, really powerful conferences. We did two in America, in San Diego. Uh, it was organized by uh, one Croatian devotee. And now he's a sannyasi. What's his name? Bhakti Ananda Tirta Swami. He's the one that contacted me, heard that I was doing this conference, and offered his temple, San Diego, as the place. I accepted. And that's how we met. And then for two years consecutively, we did conferences in San Diego. It was quite nice. Bhakti Pikash Maharaj came. Danavir Maharaj came. Jaya, what's his name? The book distributor. Vijay, he came. And uh, Dravida Prabhu, he came. And I also spoke. And we had some really interesting discussions. Those things were recorded and also many of the material was printed later. And then we switched to the UK after two years and had it at Bhaktivedanta Manor for three consecutive years until we were pushed out by the householders. <laughs> they said, we need this time for marriage ceremonies. You can't have the venue. So the Brahmachari conference got bumped in place of marriage ceremonies. <laughs> so that was uh, we had ninety Brahmacharis, the first conference in the UK, which was quite phenomenal. Mm -hmm. Brahmacharis came from all over Germany, Finland, uh, maybe some from Croatia also, and other places. And um, so it was good, but. After five years of doing this, uh, um, the we somehow or other wasn't able to find a venue anymore that would host our conferences, so we had to stop. And so Grihastas could also do the same thing, have conferences on Grihasta life, where they speak about their activities in Grihasta life and give support knowledge to each other on how to strengthen their practice of Krishna consciousness within the ashram. Uh, so that's important. We also had a few uh, conferences on for sannyasis. We did a few sannyas retreats. Our sannyasis came together. Mostly in India we did them. And they were quite successful in bringing sannyasis together. So it's a good idea for each of the ashrams to organize a conference based on strengthening their ashram and giving support to each other in the ashram. And uh, going deeper into some of the principles that we may not be aware of, where we can practice that ashram together strongly like that. But in each of the ashrams there is yagya, but the yagya, of course, this, in this age, is the most important yagya. Is yagya, is sankirtan yagya, and that is uh, that is the maha yagya in this age to perform Harinam sankirtan, to chant the Hare Krishna maha mantra together with others. That is the recommended. But then there are other yagyas, such as restricting. One. And you'll find as these, these verses that we're reading from go on describing yagya. Finally, it comes to the highest form of yagya in verse number 33. That the highest sacrifice performed is the sacrifice of knowledge. And that leads to the next verse, which is, Tadviri patipatening parabhasyena sevaya. That when one gives up all tendencies for knowledge and then takes shelter of the bona fide spiritual master, then they re re can receive real transcendental knowledge, that knowledge which is perfect, that knowledge which brings one to self realization. So, yagya is very important. Um, we are, our pantha, pantha means our line, is vairagya. Vairagya vidya nijabhakti yoga. 
So we are in a line of renunciation. Sometimes it becomes a little difficult for people to accept that. But ultimately, we have to give up this whole material world anyway. So the process of renunciation is to renounce those attachments to this material world and accept spiritual activities and develop higher consciousness. Because if we still remain attached to the things of this world, still desiring some pleasure from the things of this world, Prabhupada, as Prabhupada says, spiritual life has not begun. So only when we are no longer desirous to enjoy materially can we actually make rapid and steady, steady and rapid progress on the path back home, back to Godhead. So each of the ashrams have to understand what is their specific designated yagyas, according to the shastras. For brahmacharis, brahmacharis remain simple. They remain under the direct control of the spiritual master. They study the scriptures. They learn the scriptures. They're supposed to be able to speak the scriptures. A brahmachari is very simple. Um, he doesn't have a lot of possessions. And he is always uh, eager to carry out the instructions of the spiritual teacher. For grihastas, they raise family, teach their children to become devotees, and practice the pure devotional service. Gradually, when they reach towards the elder part of life, then they gradually reduced their relationship and gradually come to the point of uh, what we say complete renunciation, where they go to the holy places and live out the remainder of their life, or they may take sannyas in certain cases. Generally for the women, they go to holy places and then finish out their life worshiping the deity in a particular holy place. And that holy place can be your local temple also. So this is the progression of life. And then when it's time to leave the world, there's no more attachments. There's no more association with those things that may have been necessary to practice our Krishna consciousness in the early part of life. But now, Leaving that all behind, one can focus fully on the lotus feet of the Lord and then Taktwa Deham Purna Janmani Naiti Mameti Surjuna. One goes back home, back to Godhead, which is the goal of this Krishna consciousness movement. Okay, these are some tips about yagya. Uh, yagya is, it says that austerity is the wealth of the Vaishnavas. We look forward to performing austerities. Okay, any questions, comments? Hare Krishna, uh, thank you very much. Could you please say something about that? Uh, this is from you? Yes. Mm -hmm. okay. That saying that um, uh, a good brahmachari becomes a good grihasta. Well, the training that one receives in brahmachari life prepares one to enter into the grihasta ashram if it's required. And then, because they have been practiced in simplicity and uh, austerity, they don't fall into the uh, wrong consciousness when they get into grihasta life. So the from the system of ashrams, um, one should remain in brahmachari for so many years. And then after so many years, one can decide whether they want to continue or if it's required, move into the Grihastha ashram and become situated there as one's ashram and then execute devotional service there. One can be a pure devotee in any of the ashrams. So it's not like one ashram is better than another. 
It's just one ashram may be more suited for one type of person. Another ashram may be suited for another type of person. So the ashrams are, as it says, ashram means place of spiritual practice. So if one has good brahmachari training, uh, even also the ladies are trained nicely in, as brahmacharinis, then they, when they enter into the grihastha ashram, they are equipped to take on the austerities of uh, grihastha ashram. And uh, we find that uh, we see the examples in our society when one gets in grihastha ashram, they start to try to enjoy more. Or if they don't, they become fearful of the, the ashram and become too renounced in the grihastha ashram and do not develop proper relationships with their husband or wife. And because of the, uh, what we say, the fear of getting entangled in sense gratification. So we've seen that uh, both too much or too little. So with good brahmachari training, then they're, they're in the best position to enter into the grihastha ashram like that. So everyone should have a little bit of training prior to enter into that grihastha ashram because grihastha ashram is not like the husband and wife affairs of this material world. It's a place for, you know, it says when the husband is qualified and the wife is chaste, the uh, ashram, the, the, uh, the how the home is like Vaikuntha, And the goddess of fortune automatically becomes present in such a household. So when the husband is qualified, that means when he's very Krishna conscious, and the wife is very chaste, following the uh, principles of chastity, and serving her husband nicely, serving the Lord nicely, and then, as Prabhupada said, there's no need to take sannyas, because in that ashram one can... A perfect Krishna consciousness. But brahmachari training prepares one nicely for Grihastha Ashram. It's not like you fall out of brahmachari and fall into Grihastha life and expect, well, I didn't make it as a brahmachari, therefore I can make it here. Unnecessarily. And that's evaluated after some time, the spiritual master and the representatives of the spiritual master evaluate the brahmacharis and see if the, what is their tendency, whether they, they have the tendency for grihastha life or they can be situated in brahmachari life. I would say there's three types of brahmacharis. There is those who enter brahmachari ashram, but they will eventually become grihasthas. There's those who enter brahmachari ashram and are brahmacharis and will stick it out their whole life in that ashram. And then there's a third class which they could go either way. They could stay brahmachari or they could become grihastha, depending on what is the training they receive in their brahmachari ashram. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's much more we can say about that. How one was brought up in this material world will may it will make brahmachari life easier or more difficult depending on what is their training in early life. 
what were they exposed to? And what is their nature to? Any other questions? Hare Krishna, there is a question online from Boyan Boyj. Uh, the question is, uh, should a devotee endure and tolerate all possible humiliation and um, offenses? And what is the what is the maximum line? Like, up to what point should one tolerate this? Coming from where? Mm -hmm. um, it's not specified. Tolerate all humiliation and what else? Offenses. If someone's humiliating them and offending them, yeah. no, one should not allow that to happen because it's not good for either one of them. <laughs> one should avoid allowing people to to humiliate them and to offend them because it's very bad for the person who's doing it and it's not good for the person who is getting it, <laughs> obviously. So one should either speak up or create a distance between that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, in rare cases, you have to tolerate that, but that's generally not the case. Mm -hmm. These cases are very rare. Any other questions? Uh, we have a question by Lila Avatar Devidasi. Uh, sometimes uh, we are reserved while when speaking uh, to non-devotees. For example, when we do not participate in some conversation not related to Krishna consciousness, and we become we seem weird to them. But when we normally speak to people they can more easily hear something about spiritual topics. Is this small talk uh, okay in this purpose or is it just Maya's trick? No, but the small talk may lead to developing some friendship where you can eventually speak Krishna consciousness, but it should be used in that way as a tool to develop a, some friendship. And then uh, you can maybe... But that friendship shouldn't go to the point where you start accepting their value system. That's the danger. Or hearing about their activities in the material world. So we, the idea is to be friendly. But friendly means that there may be a little bit of need for some small talk, some uh, what we say nice friendly exchange. But then you have to bring it to, to spiritual life somehow. Or if you can't do that, then keep the small talk very limited and just move on. <laughs> Be friendly. Devotee is friendly with everyone. He's not rude. He's not, you know, weird. <laughs> well, you know, we have to keep our values and not be jeopardized those values <laughs> like if a guest comes in or maybe a materialist will come in just and we say we welcome them we sit them down we ask them how they are how's the family you know some friendly talk and then we get around to krishna consciousness <laughs> That's one of the reasons why we should always dress like a devotee wherever we go and wear the symbols of a devotee, such as Tilak, Sika. That way people know, oh, here's a holy person.
Okay. The audience can follow up on anything I say if they feel the need to. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You say something more about Prajalpa. Uh, what are the forms of Prajalpa and specifically in which forms can it appear in devotee association and how to avoid it? Well, uh, Bhakti Vinota Kaur's commentary on Rupa Goswami's verse from the Nectar Instruction, which talks about Prajalpa as one of the blocks in spiritual progress. He mentions there's eight types of prajapa, or eight types of nonsense talk. Uh, lying, debates, uh, criticizing, gossip, blaspheming, uh, you know, just worldly conversation. So, so your question is, what are the ones that come into the brahmachari life? No, oh, all these are there. Uh, I think the brahmacharis, just useless talk, it's called useless, just talking for the sake of talking. I was reading something that was says, if you have nothing to say, better just to remain quiet. And not talk for the sake of talking. Just like when I remember when I was, we were brahmacharis. We would always say, because, just because there's two people in the room doesn't mean they have to talk. And some people think, oh, there's somebody else in the room, we have to say something. Otherwise, we're not, you know, social. We're not friendly. But brahmacharis understand that, you know. So keeping silent helps to helps to control the mind and helps to think about when you do to speak you, you have something to say those who talk all the time really have nothing to say <laughs> Yeah, it's in that book called Bhakya Loka. Is that translated into? Yes. There's in that Bhakti Vinoda Kaur gives a commentary, and uh, he takes each of these principles, the, five, the six favorable, the six unfavorable, and gives a nice explanation of each. So on Prajapa, he mentions these eight, the eight things lies. Debates, blaspheming, criticizing, just general useless talk, and uh, there's a few. There's there's eight altogether. Can't remember all of them. Mm -hmm. I think uh, the book is there in Croatian. Just look it up. Okay, fine. Okay. Anything else on ashram? Yes, Gabriel. <laughs> Thank you for your, lecture, for your lecture, Your Holiness. After what time or when should we uh, understand that it is uh, time to enter the Kriyahasta Ashram before we 
before we think too much what age would be would be in what age is recommended for a well, brahmachari to find for him uh mataji well the age that's mentioned in the shastras after 25 but if one is planning to enter then that might be a consideration that you know after 25 but if one is not planting planning and it somehow comes as a you know a possibility then one should get evaluations from senior devotees and discuss this before one changes ashram Yeah, we need to hear from authorities who are our well-wishers and who are qualified. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But if you specifically want to know about age, usually after 25. But not, it's not like you wait till 40, you know, <laughs> that's not the idea. Between 25 and 35 is within the range for men. For women, it's between 16 and 24. Of course, now Kali Yuga has changed all around and around. Okay, so thank you very much. We'll end here. Srimad Bhagavad Gita Ki, Srila Prabhupada Ki.